Mm, this doesn't feel right. Hold on. They changed the formula. I can't be the only one who can think of at least one time when a product was reformulated and it was just never the same. I get that there are legitimate reasons why a brand would have to change their formula, such as to comply with new regulations, ingredient or supply issues, or even just genuine formula innovation. But we're not talking about that. Instead, what I think is more interesting is this growing trend of skin and hair care brands making the choice to reformulate successful products. Like why would a brand risk alienating existing customers with a reformulation, especially when you could just launch a new product? Or whether or not we're even owed product consistency as consumers? This is something I just wanted to have a chat about, so if you're new here, welcome or welcome back. It has been a little while. <laughs> I'm Elise and I develop cosmetic formulas as well as sharing simplified tutorials so that you can make them yourself. Imagine you've just launched a successful brand, you've got a clear vision, a loyal and growing fan base, and that signature product that just separates you from the competition. But that's not enough. You want to join the big leagues. You want to go mainstream. Have you ever wondered why when a brand tries to appeal to a wider audience, this tends to lead to formula changes that don't serve the existing one? And again, I'm not really talking about cost-cutting measures or the practical side of scaling up, which might need ingredient changes to fit a more universal regulation standard. But do let me know if you guys are interested in me covering the more technical aspects of product reformulations like the ingredients that they change and what they do. Rather, what I'm trying to get at here is what is it about reformulating for universal appeal that tends to make products so divisive? And you know I have to stick to my formulating roots, so to illustrate, let's make a conditioner. So let's say you're making a basic rinse out conditioner. These are the type that you put in your hair and rinse out after about two to three minutes. So a formula for something like that um, would be say about 80% water. Um, that, that sounds like a lot of water. FYI, a lot of lotions, creams, conditioners are mainly just water. So, um, <laughs> so if that's a shock to you guys, um, I'd say you want it to have some sort of conditioning element. So I would say about 2% oils. Now, again, that doesn't sound like very much, but considering this is something that you're going to wash out, um, you don't really want it to have a lot of oil and trust me, most commercial conditioners don't even have 2% oil in them. Um, next, you're going to be looking at things like um, your emulsifiers and stabilizers. So anytime you have oil and water in a solution, they will naturally separate. Um, the only way you can get a really homogeneous and smooth consistency, which you find in lotions and creams, is because they use emulsifiers and stabilizers. Um, finally, I'd say you want to think about texturizers. So it's the texturizers that we really want to pay attention to here, because this is the thing that makes a conditioner feel like a conditioner. It's what gives it that kind of slip and glossy um, consistency that makes it really easy to spread across your hair. It could be quite a few different things from like um, fatty alcohols to certain types of surfactants and conditioning agents, but this is a key element of conditioners. And then finally, let's just say you have about 1% for your preservatives. then this makes up a basic condition of formula um, but the only thing that we really need to be interested in here is the fourth ingredient which are the texturizers here's where we think about the key elements that we want from our conditioner so i'd say let's go for something that's um detangling uh you want it to have a lot of slip and finally, I think a relatively thin formula, just because that makes it really easy to very quickly spread across your hair. So this is our conditioner. It's going to be represented by this kind of um, 
droplet. Okay, and there we have our basic conditioner formula. So once you've kind of got your conditioner formula, you do have to think about how it's going to apply to hair. I have natural hair, so we'll start there. Um, natural Afro textured hair is very coily or in a kind of zigzag pattern. What we're looking for with a good conditioner formula is something that can coat and cover the hair really well in a short amount of time. So with naturally curly hair, it's super important that a conditioner has enough slip and can be easily moved across the hair strand. So with the sort of formula created, because it has an emphasis on detangling and slip, it does a really good job of getting around all the little kinks and coils. And it's a sort of conditioner that you kind of use and you feel it just melt away all the tangles and knots. That would be represented by these blue lines so you can see just how well the conditioner is able to kind of work its way around natural curls. It's great for detangling as well as coating the hair shaft. So all in all, I'd say that this is the sort of formula that will work very well for natural hair. Great. But with the same formula in mind, think about how that would work for somebody with straight or kind of wavy hair. So the structure of straight or wavy hair is actually quite different. And some of the things that make it so good for Afro textured hair might not be as good as you'd imagine for straighter hair. So if you imagine that this is a little conditioner blob, I'd say it's actually not that effective for straighter hair strands. Because we focus so much on slip and detangling abilities, it's actually quite difficult for it to stay on a straighter hair strand. So this is if you've ever experienced putting on a product and it just immediately slips off your hair and falls on the shower floor. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Uh, you almost need the conditioner to have more grip and that way it can truly kind of stick to the hair strands. If you remember, conditioners are something that are washed out within a matter of minutes, so you really don't have a lot of time. And if a conditioner is almost too loose and too watery, it ends up not being particularly effective on straighter hair strands. For me, the main issues is that it has a kind of downward trajectory. So I'd say that it kind of runs down hair and has minimal contact so in order to address issues like this you will need to tweak the formula a little bit the change is mainly going to happen in the texturizer area so if we're thinking about it what we want is something that's less slippery we also want it to have more grip so and finally, whilst the texture was a little bit more watery, I think here we want something creamier because that way we increase the amount of connection between the conditioner itself and the hair strands. So if I was going to visually represent this conditioner, I'd say it's going to be something like this. So, so if you now think about how that would work on straighter hair strands, this new conditioner actually can coat the strands really nicely. Because it has a sort of creamier texture rather than being ultra slippery, that slows the rate that it travels down the hair shaft. And if you remember, that was something that was a bit of a problem. So we've got more grip, as well as it being creamier. And I would say that this new formula is a better fit for looser textures. But like before, you have to think about how it's going to work on that curlier hair strand. All of the sort of pros that make it work for straighter hair textures actually tend not to be as advantageous for tighter, coilier hair textures. And that's because it's kind of difficult to work the conditioner through. Having more slip to a product makes it really easy to get it to go down from root to tip. But when it's slightly thicker it requires a lot more work to kind of work it over the hair strands and what you tend to find with conditioners like this is that they clump up 
where you have natural kind of kinks and coils rather than easily working their way through. So if you've ever experienced conditions like this where it just doesn't really feel like it's working through your hair, it kind of just stays in a lump and doesn't really move down. <laughs> just by tweaking the texturizers, now it's almost too clingy and it doesn't really detangle well because it's lost that slip. So I would say that unfortunately <laughs> the changes weren't particularly positive for tighter curl textures. So I hope this kind of demonstrates some of the issues that you can have when it comes to tweaking and building out a formula. So we started out with a conditioner formula that prioritised detangling and slip and to do that it had a thinner consistency. So that worked really well for natural hair or maybe curly or tighter coiled hair but it wasn't the most effective on straighter wavier hair. So in order to counter that, we then revised the formula. Because we kept the oil and water ratio exactly the same and we only looked at the texturizers, to a consumer it would look very similar. But in actual fact, it was the texturizers that made the conditioner so distinctive. By altering those to give it a creamier and more grippy formula, which is what we have here, more grip, less slippery and creamier, that now worked really well for straight hair. But unfortunately, those changes inadvertently created issues for more textured hair. So now it was too clingy and it doesn't detangle. And that kind of leads us back to our original formula. Now I know it's never quite as clear cut as this, but I hope that this kind of visually demonstrated why it can be so difficult trying to, number one, get that mass appeal, but also tweaking formulas. <sighs> Let's start on a more positive note. It's actually a really exciting time in the cosmetic industry because now more than ever there are so many indie brands and small businesses that specifically target the more traditionally overlooked or marginalised groups within the beauty industry. And we're actually starting to see the rise of products or methods that have been developed in specific cultures start to receive more global praise and attention. So you've got things like K-Beauty, hey Ayurvedic practices, and more natural moisturizers like the rise of body butters, which is intrinsically linked to West Africa and the surrounding producers. Oftentimes, some of the strongest brands have a very clear identity. They know exactly what they're for and who their target is. And just because something is specific, it doesn't make it limited. In fact, it could be anything from natural hair to green beauty to sensitive or mature skin products. We're just seeing an overall rise in targeting specific needs. And honestly, I actually think it's this positive change that's caused such an emotional response to recent product reformulations. Because these new brands have such a unique identity, it almost feels worse to see it compromised in trying to join the upper ranks of mainstream products especially when the wider cosmetic industry doesn't have the best track record of prioritizing quality ingredients or affordability. It's not like there aren't a lot of products which are more or less universally applicable and they work well across different hair types, skin types and demographics. But in a case like this where reformulations don't go over well, it's often because the effectiveness in one area is sacrificed so that it can appeal in another area. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with growing brand awareness or expanding your audience. In fact, that's just good business. But what happens when a brand takes a product that has been formulated to target a specific niche or concern and tries to make that universal or mainstream? It's not as if this is new or just one particular type of brand does this. Rather, I want to look at this from a formulation standpoint and why it's often so unsuccessful when a product is reformulated specifically to have broader appeal. And I think that's what has people thinking about this so much. Why not just create a new product? I think for a lot of people, this is what it all boils down to. Brands have the right to tweak, modify and enhance their own formulas. And in a lot of cases, that type of innovation is welcomed with open arms. But in cases where there's such a tangible difference after the reformulation that it risks alienating their existing customer base, why not just create a new product? In fact, bringing out ranges or having slightly different variants of one product often creates that personalized experience that people love. 
having your own custom skin or hair care products that have been specifically designed to address your needs is the dream that sadly many never get to experience but what if you could watch this video to see just how easy it is to create your own products from scratch this time without the fear of reformulation thanks for watching